Hello, for today's video lecture, we're going to be talking about belt friction. So anywhere that a belt or a cable is wrapped around a surface, there's potential for belt friction. So this could be something that is helpful. Uh, here we are using a belt wrapped around two pulleys. We're transmitting a torque from the input down here at the motor uh, up to the blower uh, here at the top. So here we want the belt friction to kind of drive the belt around and to transfer the moment from one side to the other. Uh, it's also in cases like this. So here we have a bear bag on a tree. So we've got uh, some food in a bag. We use a rope tied, kind of thrown over a tree branch. Uh, and if we pull on this, we'd actually have belt friction up here as well because the rope is wrapped around kind of the tree branch up at the top. So both cases, we have this belt friction Sometimes it's useful, sometimes we want to maximize the belt friction where we're driving a system with it. Sometimes we would want to minimize the friction where we're you know, lifting an object into a tree where it does need to slide. So why does belt friction exist? So when we have tension in a belt uh, or a cable or a rope, uh, we must have a normal force that exists that prevents the belt or rope or cable from falling. So here we've got the belt in black uh, and then whatever we're wrapped around in silver here so if we have a tension, uh, tension one, tension two are the same here, we'd have a normal force that is kind of pressing out on the rope, out on the cable, uh, preventing it from falling through the object. So if we have a normal force and the tensions differ, uh, it would tend to slide, except whenever we have sliding that might occur, we're gonna have a friction force that opposes that. So if the, the tension forces differ, uh, the normal force plus the sliding would result in friction force. So the friction force is always going to try to prevent the rope or the belt or the cable from sliding relative to the object we're working with. So here we're going to stop for a second and talk about the types of belts because we're going to start with a simple system and work our way up to more complex systems. So first we have flat belts, uh, which is a system where a belt, a rope, or a cable is wrapped around a non-grooved or loosely grooved surface or pulley. Uh, and this is the simplest system, this is what most systems are, um, unless they're specifically designed otherwise. And it offers a base level of potential friction. So the alternative is V-belts. So a V-belt is a belt where, uh, or a system where the belt is run through a V-shaped groove on a pulley. Uh, and most of these are designed that way. It's a little more complex uh, and it offers more potential friction. So in the case where we are using the friction to drive something, uh, like we had our motor attached to the blower, uh, we might use a V-belt to try to get more power uh, through our system because we can get more friction to transfer that torque. Alright, so let's start with flat belts. If we go back to our simple system, uh, a flat belt is any belt where the belt or the cable or the rope is in contact with the back surface. So here is an example of a, an old uh, machine that has a flat belt on it. So it's simply a flat surface on the pulley and the belt itself is flat as well. Uh, they tend to not be used in modern machinery, but there's a lot of examples in uh, older machinery of flat belts. Um, and in this case, we have just the pulley surface and the belt just kind of sits on top of it. We also have instances where we have a little bit of a groove, but it still does not count as a groove or a, a V-belt. So here we've got a cable uh, and this is a cable running a ski lift and there's a, a small groove in here but mostly uh, the cable is just kind of in, in contact with that back surface. So if it's in contact with the back surface that's the important factor uh, here for the flat belt versus V-belt. Alright so in that case if we are in contact with the outside surface and if we are assuming impending motion, so the belt is about to slip, um, we've adjusted T1 and T2. So T1 is the smaller tension, T2 is going to be our bigger tension. So if I pull on T2 hard enough, the belt's going to slide around my pulley or my uh, branch or whatever, uh, and I'd have this, this sliding motion. So if we assume impending motion, the normal force is the, or sorry, the friction force is the normal force times mu static. Um, and so, Skipping through some of the calculus of this, because we have a normal force that is not constant, we need to integrate around uh, the kind of the circular arc of contact here. Uh, we find out that T2 max, 
So the point of impending motion uh, is equal to T1 times E to the mu static times beta. Uh, so T1 is always our smaller tension. And if we've got a system where it's driving some system, so if it's a, a motor to some output or uh, we're connected to the alternator in our car, the resting tension is also T1. Um, T2 is the larger tension force. So this is going to be what determines if it slips or not. Euler's constant is E. So this is always the same number. It's about 2.718. Uh, mu static is just the coefficient of friction between our belt material and our surface. And beta is the uh, contact angle. So the more the cable or belt is wrapped around the object, the more friction we're going to wind up having. So beta here, it's important you always measure this in radians. So this is a little more than 180 degrees, so a little more than pi radians for beta here. So this is our kind of point of impending motion again. So what does that mean? If we go to the actual value, so if I know T1, uh, if I know T2 is less than this T2 max that I have calculated, uh, the belt's not going to slip. So if I'm trying to lift something up, kind of the cable around the tree branch, it's not going to lift. Uh, if I'm trying to drive something, so if I've got my motor connected to the blower and I've got two pulleys, I don't want it to slip, that's good. Uh, that means that the belt is going to effectively transfer power from input to output. Uh, when T2 is exactly equal to T2 max, it's not slipping yet, but it is at that point of impending motion. And then if T2 uh, exceeds T2 max, the belt is going to slip. So going back to our tree branch example, that's what we want. We want to have the rope slide over the tree branch. Uh, going to our motor connected to some output uh, side of things, that's not good. We don't want the belt to slip when we're transferring power from input to output because that's going to just not transfer the power effectively. It's going to generate friction, generate heat, uh, and it's not going to drive the output. So it depends on what situation we want. If we want T2 to be less than this T2 max or more than this T2 max, depending on if we want to not slip or slip. All right, so complicating this is we also frequently in modern machinery use V-belts. So some pulleys have a groove where the belt comes in contact with the side walls of the pulley rather than the bottom surface of the pulley. Uh, so this effectively increases the normal forces on the belt, therefore increases the friction forces, uh, potential friction forces on the belt and pulley. So a flat belt looks kind of like this. A V-belt has a groove built into it where the belt is going to fit snugly into that groove. So here's a blown up view of that. So I've got my uh, top of the side view of the pulley and the blue piece is the belt. So uh, with the normal forces on the side of the belt, they're actually going to be lined up, wind up being larger than they would be for a similar flat belt. Larger normal forces, larger friction forces, uh, and it's going to enhance the amount of friction I can get out of my system. So the in increase in friction depends upon our angle alpha. So the steeper or the smaller the angle alpha, the steeper the walls, uh, the more friction we get. So we still are going to use the more or less the same equation as before. So T2 max is equal to T1 times E to the mu static enhanced times beta. So the only difference is this mu static enhanced. We're going to modify mu static for our V-belts, where mu static enhanced is simply the old value of mu static, so the based on just the materials, divided by the sine of alpha over 2. So take this angle alpha of our belt, divide that by 2, take the sine, original mu static over that sine value is our mu static enhanced that we'd use over here. So we get kind of a stickier belt uh, based on the V-belt configuration. Other than that, it's going to be the same uh, formulas as we had before. All right, so let's talk about the maximum torque and the maximum power transfer in belt-driven systems. So sometimes for simple problems, we're kind of sliding a rope across one thing. Uh, but in many cases, we worry about belt friction because we've got some input driving some output pulley. Uh, and in that case, I want to know how much torque can I uh, put on the input, how much torque can I get in the output, how much power can I transfer in the system? So let's look at that. So once we know the kind of 
the tension. So we'd want to figure out T1 and T2. Uh, we can figure out the torque or the power transmitted in each pulley in a belt driven system. So <clears throat> T1 is always going to be the resting tension. So if we've got two things connected, we measure the tension when nothing is moving. One side is always going to stay at that lower value. Uh, when we are transferring power like this, uh, we have a moment at the input and we have some sort of resistance on the output. The T2 values are going to get larger. So the greater these moments, uh, the greater the T2 value. So if I put too much resistance on the output or I put too much uh, moment on the input, uh, this T2 is going to get too large. It's going to start to slip. All right, so the maximum input or output torque will simply be the net moment uh, on that pulley when the tension difference is at its maximum. So when T2 max or T2 is equal to T2 max. So when that's the case, tension difference, uh, so T2 max minus T1 over the radius of the input, that's going to be our maximum input torque before slipping. Uh, on the output side, it's going to be T2 max minus T1 times our output. So if we have a uh, a different radius for the pulley on the output uh, is the same calculation as before. So it just depends on the pulleys. Um, and then the last part is power. So uh, the rotational definition of power is the torque transmitted times the angular velocity in radians per second. Uh, that last part gets to be a little bit of the dynamics definition. Um, but uh, we're actually going to find that the power is what kind of unites these two pieces. So the uh, maximum input moment, maximum input torque times the uh, omega input is going to be the same as the output. So there is a maximum power that we can set up for any pulley driven system where we look at either input or output. So if you've got a hundred horsepower motor, uh, you'd need a certain setup no matter what the input and output pulleys are uh, in your system. All right. So that's all we have for today's video lecture. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you again.